now. Give it up. The name of Jesus. This might not be Easter, but it's Easter. Because you realize Easter is every day. Our God is risen. He is not a piece of wood that we made into an idol. Our God went to a tomb, stood, and was put on a, to a cross for our sins. So Easter is every day in this church. And the message of Christ is so important that we should be preaching it every day, not just during this holiday season, amen? There's people's lives on stake because he went to the, to the, to the cross for us and he had scars for us and, he, and we have a walking miracle in this room today. Caden, would you come here for a minute? And I just, I, I just want, this, this young man that I'm bringing up, I didn't tell him I was doing this. This young man last week had a bullet in his leg. A year ago in June, got shot by a stray bullet, and it hit him in the leg. Last Sunday, he is sitting in a church, and all month he kept going, Pastor, the pain is getting worse. I'm getting angry. I can't handle it anymore. And I kept praying for you. And last Sunday, he's next door on the other side of the wall and with Impact Kids in their, in their service, and he let out a scream, from what I was told, because the pain was just so bad. And we, we went and got Mama, and Mama came over and brought him over here and didn't say a word to anybody. And he sat down. He didn't want to leave, right? You wanted to sit during service in pain. It didn't matter how bad it was because he knew Christ was going to handle it. After church, he gets in my car to drive him home, and he still hasn't said a word. But Mama goes, I got to take him to the hospital. I said, okay. And we took you to the hospital, right? And the church, I asked you guys to pray. I asked the church to pray. And mama, my mama, said, I'm not praying for healing. I'm praying that the, bu the bullet moves. Because if it moves, they can take it out. And if they can take it out, he will be healed. And what happened this week? They took it out. They took it out. Amen? Amen? Caden, show me what you can do now. So happy for you. Thank you. And not just today. Today is Palm Sunday, and Jesus comes riding in. But today is also Baptism Sunday with us, and He is one of the. Uh, I was going to say inductees into baptism, but He is one of the bapti baptize bap baptize He's going to baptize today. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. You have a seat. So, with all that said, you guys can have a seat. I'm just excited. Because we are in the holiday season. We are in the resurrection season because we do serve a God that is king and, and, and is risen. So if you are a first-time guest here today, we have a little couple little ones here that are first-time guests. Make sure that they get their little gift, uh, the first-timers. Um, fill out the U card, though, on your seat if you're a first-time guest. Like us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, all our sermons are up to date on YouTube, so if you missed the service, you can watch them on YouTube. You can watch them on Facebook. Um, so we thank you. But the, the, the U card is all about you. And the reason we have you fill that out is so we can get to know who you are. So we get a little information about you. And I want to give you a little information about me. So every first Sunday of every first Sunday of the month, we do something called Party with the Pastor. If you have not signed up for Party with the Pastor, uh, you, you're more than welcome to sign up, put on, uh, on your U card, circle it, say, I want to be part of the party with the pastor, and I will talk to you later in the week. Amen? You can also put a prayer request on that. You can put um, anything that you need on that U card. It's about you and what you need so we can help you and serve you better. Amen? With that said, we have a video, and during the video, the children can get up and go to Impact Church. Amen? Can you show that video, please? As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. 
They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Y'all today received something walking in. Can you raise those up? Can you, can you wave them? Wave them like you just don't care, right? Come on, show me how you can wave them. Wave them. Because what you are doing is, is exactly what the, the, the Israelites and the people 2,000 years ago were doing. That our Savior, by the name of Jesus Christ, right? By, of Jesus, came riding in on a donkey. Think of this. When you picture a king, what do you picture? Do you picture him riding in on a little donkey? And we call him an uh, ass, right? Excuse me, but that's what we call donkeys, don't we? Do you picture him riding on that? I picture a king on a stud, right? On a big old monster horse riding in with a crown on and clothes to, to match that. In majesty, right? Our king didn't do that. Our king came and preached that he was a servant. He was not to be served. He was to serve. Amen? And that's exactly what he was doing that day. And they were, they, were, they were bystanders, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people in the town of Jerusalem. Why? Because they came to do something. They came to be part of the Passover feast to remember that God, years before that, sent his angel to cover them and to kill them and get them out of slavery that day. The Passover, right? And this is what, it's such a symbol for us that the Passover was alive and he was coming and he was giving and he came to serve and not to be served. And that day they were waving their palm branches. They were singing, Hosanna, the kids. It was awesome watching them out there today. The little itty bitties were out there today yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna. I don't have a clue if they even know what it means, but it was adorable and people are beeping at them, right? They're getting greeting, they're greeting people out there. Why? Because they love the Lord. And this is the same thing. These people, they, they loved the Lord. They didn't know what they were loving at the time, but they loved the Lord. And the people, the Pharisees and the leaders and the, and the prominent people, they didn't. See, it's a beautiful story of our king coming and being a part of the Passover week, right? We call it Holy Week, right? And for Holy Week, we are going to be starting, next, uh, starting tomorrow, Monday through Thursday, we will be in this building, or in this facility, from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock with prayer and reflection, to remember what happened that week, to be in prayers, and to remember what happened in that week. They didn't know what was about to happen, but in five days, something changed the earth and our view of life forever. And yes, it starts with a beautiful story of him riding in on a donkey. But on that Friday, something happened. And he was put on a cross. Why? Because people were jealous. People were haters. People didn't really see the value in who he said he was. But today is a day of glory. Today is a great a day of clapping and singing and praising, which we've done. But now I want to do part two of what we did last week. Anchoring into the cross. Did they do a beautiful job up here or what? Does it look awesome? So thank you so much. I'm not kidding. I walked in. It was on Sunday mornings. They kicked me out. They don't let me stay in here because... My hands want to be on everything. So I go, and I go drive, and I go pick up people, and I, I make sure that they get to church on, on time, right? I walked in there, and I was like, dang, it looks beautiful up here. Last week it looked good, but dang, this week it looked, I don't know, or something different. But anyways, but if you notice, there's anchors up here. And last week we talked about 
that our lives are not futile, that we have purpose. We can anchor into the cross because God gives us purpose. God gives us a hope. God gives us a life. Amen? Without him, we can't really do anything. We can do stuff, but it's not the same. Am I right? With Christ in it, it gives us hope. It gives us that purpose. So we're going to continue this anchoring into, into, uh, anchoring into another point, our second point today. These six hours, like I said, that, that six hours on a Friday changed the course of history forever. And it's the second anchor point today, and it's the title of the message is, My Failures Are Not Fatal. My Failures Are Not Fatal. Next, uh, next week is Easter, and we'll finish up with the third anchor point, My Death Is Not Final. But today's anchor point is, my failures are not fatal. Would you guys do me a, uh, a favor? And would you guys all stand for the reading of the word? We're going to read God's word, and i got to get louder than the kids behind me. We're going to be reading from Luke today. Luke 23, if you have your Bibles, please stand. I will not start until we all can stand. Jessica's the only one that is allowed not to stand. Thank you. I miss your bird up because sometimes I, I understand if you can't. If you're capable, please stand. And this is not a Palm Sunday mess, like... I'm not reading from Palm Sunday. We, we just read it. We just saw that video about this is the cross we're going to be reading about. I said they just glorified God, right? He came riding in on the song and they're singing and praising and dancing. But what we're reading from is the cross because of what the cross has done for us. And it starts with the mob, the mob, the, the same mob that was just dancing and, and praising and singing for him. It says, but the mob shouted louder and louder. They weren't singing Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna anymore. Demanding that Jesus be crucified and their voices prevailed. So Pilate sentenced Jesus to death, to die as they demanded. Verse 32 says, two others, the man on the left. And the man on the right, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. And when they came to the place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified with him. One was on his right, one was on his left, it says. If you bounce down to 39, it says, One of the crim criminals hanging beside him scoffed at him. Just days ago, everybody's clapping, cheering, and praising him. This is a guy on the cross next to him, scoffing at him. <clears throat> I can understand everybody else scoffing at him. Why? Because that they were just doing that. But this is the guy about to die, and he's scoffing at him. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal in verse 40 says, oh, the other criminal... He protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to death? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into my kingdom, when you go into your kingdom. And I love this. Jesus replies, I assure you. Did you catch that word? Assure. Assure. Assure, I assure you, today you will be in paradise. I want to stay on that word for one second. I, I, somebody needs to hear this. Your salvation is sh uh, uh, assured. Your salvation is assured. It is given to you freely by the cross. It is given to this man is given to us also. Your future is assured in the cross. We don't need to look any further than that cross. 
and that empty tomb, it is assured, and we have a place. I'm getting ahead of myself. But we are assured. And somebody in this room, I know it, and somebody watching needs to hear that. It is not done because of our works. It is because it's done of his works. Amen? Amen to that. You guys, Father God, as we go into your word, as we break this down, as we look to the cross, to your son, to the Savior, to that empty tomb, Father God, work on our ears, our, our eyes, our hearts, our souls. Lord, let this, your word be the light to our path and, the, and a light in, into our path and our feet, Father God, to get us from point A to point B and into eternity. Lord, let us be like one of the criminals. That their heart is unhardened to hear the truth and to see who you really are, our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen? Everybody, you can have a seat. <clears throat> Stop talking up. He, he assures this man, you will be with me today in paradise. Paradise in, in Spanish. It says par, par, Parisio. Did I say that right? Parisio. Eliana. Parisio? Parade. Ah, oh, man, I've been practicing all week and I still get it wrong. Parisio. Ah, whatever. Pariso. I can't roll R's, so don't expect me ever to roll an R. I've tried my whole life. I can suck a noodle because I'm Italian, but I can't roll an R. Parisio. But this, in paradise, he's going to be with him. He assures him that he's going to be there with him. And it's not just in Luke's gospel. It's in all the gospels, this story. Why? Why was it written in all? Not, not every story of Jesus was written in all four gospels. You know that, right? Certain ones have all of them. Some of them only have, some of the Gospels have maybe three out of the four have them. But this was one of the, the stories that were written in all the Gospels. There's a reason why. And it's, I don't know if it's biblical, but it's my reason. Because it tells us, it teaches us. It doesn't just tell us, it teaches us a lesson in life. We all have a choice to make. We all have a choice to make. We all have two options in life. We can meet Jesus at the cross, or we can scoff Jesus at, at the cross. See, the option one is a rebellious heart. He's the guy on the left. And we're going to break this down and go deeper into it. But he scoffs at him. He laughs at him. If you're really him, prove it. The second option, though, is your repentant heart. A heart that has been changed because they had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Not because of religion, not because of the Sadducees, the Pharisees, not because of the laws of Moses that Moses gives us. It's because they, have a, they, he, they had an encounter with Jesus Christ on that cross. So my question is, by the end of the day, which heart are you? Which, which man are you on the cross? Do you have that rebellious heart or do you have a repentant heart? Before we can decide on that, I, I want to look at characteristics of a rebellious heart. And I'm going to go fast, okay? Because we got baptisms after this, we still got, okay? But what are the characteristics of a rebellious heart? Number one, a rebellious heart it joins in with the crowd. Remember, like I said, days ago, they were just praising and singing and dancing, and, right? But because of the, the leaders of the time, they already plotted to have Jesus killed, right? So they didn't believe in him. They didn't want this to happen. So I can understand them and the people, because when, when the leaders do something in life, or your boss, or your a spouse or husband or the political realm right now, when they do something, it's easy to join the crowd, isn't it? 
So to the people of the times, it's easy to follow their leaders. Why? Because it's their leaders. They're supposed to follow their leaders, right? We're supposed to follow people. It's easy to join in the crowd. Kids nowadays follow in the crowd, right? If you're not on Snapchat, TikTok, or all these things, it, it, this is how they communicate, and it's easy to follow them, right? What do we do? I ask you guys every week, would you follow us on Facebook? Would you follow us on, on YouTube and Instagram, right? It says, one of the criminals hanging beside him, though, scoffed. So if you're the Messiah, so you're the Messiah, are you? He's scoffing. He goes with the crowd, a rebellious heart goes with the crowd. He goes with the flow. I don't like going with the flow. I've never been a person to go with the flow. I don't know, ever since I was a little kid, I don't like going with the flow. And I don't know if it's because I had the Holy Spirit in me as a little kid, which I, I, I did, but I didn't know it was the Holy Spirit. I knew right from wrong, but I chose wrong in times of my life because I, I didn't trust the cross. I didn't understand the cross. I didn't understand who Jesus was. But it's easy to go with the flow, isn't it? I want to be like a salmon. Do you guys know what a salmon does? Once a year, what they do? They flight, swim upstream. All the other fish are laughing and la and, and, and what are you doing, you goofy fish? You're going the wrong way. It's hard to go upstream. But there's a reason they do it. They go spawn. They go mate. They go lay their eggs. And then we have more salmon. They know what they're doing. I want to be a salmon. I want to go against the grain. I want to go upstream. And I don't want to do it for myself. I want to do it for Christ. Because he went upstream. You are meant to to be different. When we are in Christ Jesus, when we are in Christ, we are set apart, it says in the Bible. We are a holy people, it says in the Bible. We are not supposed to go with the flow. I am supposed to go against the flow. See, again, you have a choice. You can go with the flow, your heart can be hardened, or you could Go with God. I, I wrote in my notes, we can either have a popular voice, right? You, I, I, all my, I got a bunch of pastor friends that want to be influencers. They can go, some, some are good influencers and some are <laughs> There's a lot of influencers on this, on this little device, right? The popular voice. I, we can either be the popular voice and go with the crowd, or we can be a prophetic, prophetic voice that goes with God. I would rather be that prophetic voice that goes with God, because I know the end, and so do you. This is why every Sunday should be Easter at Impact, at every church. It's easy to go with the flow. It's hard to be that prophetic word. You realize all, all the prophetic the prophecies in the, in the Bible and all the, the prophets in the Bible, what happened to them? They were all killed. <laughs> Why? Because they went against the flow. I'm not saying your whole life to go against the flow. There's some things that we're supposed to go with, right? But when it comes to Christ and his ways and God's ways, we're supposed to go with the flow. His flow. We can either be the popular voice and go with the crowd or we can have a prophetic, prophetic voice that goes with God and does the will of God, even when it's unpopular. Proverbs 14, 12, the, the, the teens are reading Proverbs one a day for the next 31 days. And I, think, I actually think today is Proverbs 14 when they started. It, it says in verse 12, there's a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. How many of you have walked your own path? You have walked your own path going, man, my men in the, in the room are being honest. I like that. We've all walked our own path, and our path leads to death. Why are we having the kids read Proverbs? Who wants your child wise? 
who not a, who wants your child wise in God's ways? If you read the book of Proverbs, it, it starts off with that. These are words of Solomon who is wise, and they're meant for correction. They're meant to help us. They're help to, to walk on the path of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, you can enter, in Matthew 7, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gates. The highway to hell is broad. You guys ever hear an ACDC song? Highway to hell? He says, I'm going to see my friends in hell. We're going to party. That's not what hell is. <clears throat> hell is the separation of God from man. He's literally in hell. That I can't be with my maker. Imagine you can't be with your mom or dad or a loved one that you love so much because they're gone and there's no way to get them back to them. We've lost loved ones. I've lost many loved ones. It started when I was a young teen. But I have hope. Why do I have hope? Because of that empty tomb. And it says, hell is broad and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few will ever find it. It brings me joy. It also brings me scaredness. Because I can call upon the Lord and I got to make sure I'm secure in the Lord. And that's the narrow path. It doesn't say we're going to be in paradise that day. It says by following, by going down this narrow path, it's not going to go with the flow. You're going to go against the flow, and it's going to be difficult. You will still have hard times. You will still have good times. You will still have blessed times. You still have ugly times. You will still get sick in life. You will still have all the problems of this world. Well, when you anchor into the power of the cross, all those seem minute, and I don't have to worry about them. Because my Jesus is risen and gives me the hope to heaven, to hope to eternity, amen? The second is a rebellious heart questions what God says. The second one, it questions what God says. Scoffer number one, he says, so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself. That wasn't the first time a rebellious heart questioned God and questioned what God said. If you go all the way back to Genesis, in the beginning, in verse chapter 3, verse 1, it says, did, you read, did God really say you must not eat? the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Did God really say it? See, a rebellious heart questions the authority of God. When I lost my sister over 20-some years ago now, I questioned the authority of God. And I questioned just what the scoffer said. If you're such a good, saving, merciful God, why can't you? Why did you take my sister? Why would you take the best one out of six of us, the one that believed in you, the one that loved you, the one that didn't have sex or drink or drugs? Why would you take her? And if you're so powerful, bring her back. And my heart got so hard that day. It was already getting hard. Do you ever have a heart attack? I don't want to know if you had a heart attack. But you know, if you're having a heart attack, your arteries get clogged. And when we were born, they're clean. You can see through them. Why? Because the blood flows through them, right? But years of eating crap and, and not working out and smoking and all these things, they start to get black. Your arteries start to get hard. And this scoffer, this criminal, we don't know why he was on the cross, but he had to do something to be on the cross. His heart was hard. His arteries were clogged. He couldn't see the blood running through. He couldn't see what was in front of him. He questions God. Many of us have been there. You see this in the world right now. 
So many people are questioning, what's my purpose? What's my life? I, am I supposed to be a boy? Am I supposed to be a girl? Am I supposed to? God gave us all the answers in the Bible. He does. I, you can look through it. And all your answers are in there. My answers came in to, from a Bible, from the word, and from prayer, and God speaking to me. Why my sister passed. A rebellious heart questions what God says. And we're seeing that nowadays. The Bible talks about that. In the days, in the last days, we are going to see things that we haven't seen before. People are going to do what they want to do, when they want to do it. It's a rebellious heart that lives out there. Because somebody questioned God's authority. Number three. A rebellious heart demands a sign. A rebellious, a rebellious heart demands a sign. He says, prove it in, in, in 39, verse 39. Prove it by saving yourself. Prove it. I want to see a sign. Why are you doing it? Us too. While you're at it. The man to the left, the guy talking about this, is, is, is scoffing at God. Show me a sign. He had the sign in front of him. Right next to him on a cross like him and he had the risen and the... the, the he had God with him. How many of you have asked for a sign when it's sitting right in front of you and you don't even see it? He was blind because of his arteries being hard. Are you willing to be corrected? Are you willing to change for Christ? Or are you going to stay on that wide path that will lead you to hell? The sign was right next to him, and the sign is right next to you today and in front of you today. Are you willing See, Jesus says in Matthew 12, verses 38 and 39, one day some teachers of religious law and Pharisees came to who? To Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. Prove it! And Jesus replied, Only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give you is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Oh, if you don't know who Jonah was, Jonah was like Will, running from the God-given ability that he gave him to preach the gospel. Where, where is he? He didn't hear that. See, he's always out of the room when they say stuff like that. I don't know why he's out of the room. And Jonah ran. He didn't want to preach the word. I don't want to bring salvation to this Nineveh. They're, they're horrible people. They're, they're, they're the, the scum of the earth. So he runs, and he runs away, and he gets on a boat, and the boat's going crazy. That story sounds familiar, too, in the, in the Gospels. And all of a sudden, the, the board, the, the, the people on the ship say, what the heck is going on? Jonah says, there, it's God. He's after me. So throw me over, and you guys will be fine. So they throw him over, and what happens? The word says that a, 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 a big fish eats him. How many days was he in that fish? This is, this is what Jesus means by this. That I will give you a sign of the prophet Jonah. Well, how many days was he in that fish? How many days was our Lord and Savior in the grave? It was a, prof, a prophetic message that our Christ was coming, and this is what was going to happen. And that's the sign he gives him. And he's literally sitting next to the guy on the left, scoffing at him with the sign right in front of him, and, and he says this. Jesus, I am the sign. I will resurrect. See, a way we can show our sign. Not God give us a sign. The way we can show our sign to Jesus, to God, to the Holy Spirit, or why we love him, 
The word says is to be baptized. Jesus gave us a command before he left and said, go into all the earth to teach and preach and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of Jesus, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Today, we are doing baptisms. And it's not too late for you that if you, hopefully this word will stir something inside of you, that you can go show an outward sign of the inward workings of God in you. That is why we do baptisms. This is why we have baptisms. Because God is working on your inside. He's taking your rebellious arteries and clearing them and going to clean them. And that's the symbolism of, of the baptism. That I get dunked, dunked under the water, not sprinkled. I get dunked and I go to the grave with Jesus. And I rise up to like Jonah out of the whale. Because that's what Jesus did. So if you, it's just not too late. You don't have to go to a class. We do a class. I don't care. If you, the Lord is working on you. Go get baptized. Number four, a rebellious heart sees God as someone to be used, not to, some, not to worship. Not someone to worship. A rebellious heart sees God as someone to be used, not someone to be worshipped. And then again, back to verse 29, it says, and us too. Hey, if you're the Messiah, go save yourself. And us too, while, while you're at it. Think about it. How many people you see on next Sunday, and I'm not, maybe I shouldn't say this, I say it, I, I, please forgive me if you don't like it, if you're watching. How many people next Sunday will you see at church? Churches around the world will be packed to the gills. When we need something, we call upon God, don't we? What about the other 300 and how many days are in a year? 365, I don't even know. How many 364 days of the year? Okay, 363 days because then we see them back on Christmas. 62, whatever, man. Yeah, and there's some other holidays, Mother's Day, Father's Day, we see them right. But you see what I'm saying? When we need something, we call upon God, don't we? The other days, though, these seats are empty. The Old Testament people, they came to worship God. They got taken out of the desert, right? And they were out of slavery. And God put in place the Passover feast, the harvest feast, all these feasts. There was a reason why. It wasn't to come just bring your sacrifices. They brought their sacrifices to get a repentant heart so they could do what with a clean heart? To worship God. They brought their best stuff for and sacrificed their best animals. They brought the best spices. They brought, why? To, so they could go worship the Lord. They wanted a clean heart. Same thing with tithes. Do you bring the best or do you bring the rest? Serving in the house of the Lord. Do you just come and take? Or do you actually serve like Jesus said? Do you come and serve when it's convenient for you? I'll do the fifth Sunday of every month. You know that's only four Sundays like that, right? Oh, it's convenient. To become... A rebellious heart sees God as someone to be used, not to worship. We come with wrong motives. I'm not saying you can't go to God. It says in the word to go to God with your problems. It says to go with him in every situation. But it says to worship him in those times. It says to worship him in the good times and the bad times. It doesn't mean to scoff at him during those times. It's to worship him. Amen? We, we come to him with wrong motives. People want to, to be forgiven, but they don't want to repent. There's no fear of God. Number five. A rebellious heart doesn't acknowledge its sin, but wants relief from it. They want to be repentant of it, right? They want to be forgiven of it. A rebellious heart doesn't acknowledge its sin, but wants relief from it. Think about it. The first criminal, he doesn't even acknowledge that he sinned. He didn't even say anything to God uh, that he did anything wrong. 
but he wants the benefits of what Jesus has. I remember, I, I've told you guys this many times, the day I was coming down so bad I thought I was going to die, there was many times, but this day there was something different about it, and I just couldn't get, something was happening. And I said, Lord, if you get me through this, I will stop. Sounded good, right? Oh, he's got a repentant heart. I knew deep down inside if I got through it, the next day I was going to do the same vain thing. And guess what I did the next day? I called my, de my dealer. Let's do it again. I didn't acknowledge my sin, but I wanted relief from it. That type of heart is never going to get God's attention. It got it. It took two and a half years later for me to get it. That prayer went to him, but my rebellious heart never did until two and a half years later. But on the other hand, the second criminal, we see a repentant heart, don't we? I know I did something wrong, and Jesus, when when you go, will you remember me? That will always get God's attention. And in that moment, I was repenting. But I knew I wouldn't worship. See, I want to talk, I don't want to end on characteristics of a, a rebellious heart. I want, here's the hope we have in Christ. This is where we can anchor in the, in the cross right now. I want to talk about the characteristics of a repentant heart, because that's where the hope comes from. That's where, where we can anchor into, amen? So my, the first one, a repentant heart fears God. A repentant heart fears God. In, in verse 40, he says, but the other criminal, he protested, don't you fear God? even when you have been sentenced to death? See, we're all sentenced to death. You realize that, right? We all have a death date. We all have a birthday. We all have a death date. It's in between those dashes of what we do with our lives that matters. Proverbs 1, seven says, The fear of the Lord is the foundation of true... What, what proverb was that? One. And what does he say? The fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. But few fools despise wisdom and discipline. And I'm not getting on a pedestal. We see it daily. The fear of the Lord is gone in this world. Some have it, but the world itself does not. Why? Because all the prophets are gone. We want to be popular instead of prophetic. We want to go with the flow instead of fearing the Lord. I can do whatever I want. Is that not what we teach? The world teaches? You can be whoever you are. You guys heard about the, the girl that was in a school and, and told the school she was a cat and they made a cat bathroom for her? You're not a cat. You're a man, you're a woman. Deal with it and figure it out. Because I've been confused in life. Because my mind wasn't right. But I had no fear of the Lord. And fear isn't, I can't come to you, Lord. No! Fear is... You are my maker, and I love you so much that what, what your word says, I'm not going to be perfect at, but please, Lord, forgive me when I'm not, and Lord, thank you when I am. I'm going to change, and I'm going to try my hardest to change and to fear you and to give you my love, my respect, my, my love for you. 
And I need your Holy Spirit to come in me to have that repentant heart because a repentant heart fared God. Scoffer 1 did not fear him. Scoffer 2 said, Oh, don't you fear it? The word says we will have an account for everything we do and say. And I truly believe that. If I am not in Christ, I am going to have to have an account for everything I have done and said. But because I am in Christ, my sins have been washed away. Amen? The guy on the cross, number two, he didn't go to a baptism class. He didn't get baptized. He didn't even say he believed. He said, Lord, remember me. Why? Because he had a repentant heart. He didn't serve in a church. He didn't go to a small group. He didn't go to a Bible study. He had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And, he, and the fear of the Lord showed him that this was Jesus. This was the Messiah. A repentant heart acknowledges his sin. Number two. A repentant heart acknowledges his sin. You can tell the kids I'm almost done. Somebody, if somebody can tell the children I'm about, about five minutes. A repentant heart acknowledges his sin. Verse 41 says, we deserve to die for our crimes. He tells the other scoffers, goofball, hey, we're both up here. We both did something wrong, and we're not up here alone. Uh, we got, we've got the Messiah here, and we have a way out. We deserve to die, and he doesn't. Do you re he realizes this, that the Christ came perfectly with no sin. Throughout his life, no sin. He didn't do anything wrong. All he said was, I'm the Lord. I am who I am. Because he was who he said he was. He didn't lie about that. He didn't have to acknowledge his sin. But the guy on the cross did. The guy on the right. And he says, we deserve to die for our sins. A repentant heart, he fears the Lord. A repentant heart acknowledges his sin. Number three, a repentant heart acknowledges Jesus, Jesus' innocence. Verse 41 continues to say, but this man has done nothing wrong. Born of a virgin. Why? Because the Holy Spirit impregnated her. It was not born of a natural birth. Oh. In the temple, he destroyed stuff. And he got mad. He got righteous mad. That was his father's house. Did you ever have a party in your mom and dad's house and somebody destroyed something? I had lots of parties in my house. I'd get mad. It was a righteous man. I can destroy something in my house, in my mom and dad's house, but if you come into my house and you destroy something, guess what? I got a righteous man, right? This is what Jesus did. Not out of anger, not out of hate, out of love. A house is supposed to be a house of prayer and worship. A repentant heart acknowledges Jesus' innocence. He did nothing wrong. And that is what this man saw and understood. Number four, a repentant heart acknowledges Jesus' power to save. A repentant heart acknowledges Jesus' power to save. Verse 42 says, Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He acknowledged him. If you watch wrestling, in a couple weeks, what, Christopher watches you. What does, what does Roman Reigns say? Acknowledge me. Right? This sinner acknowledges Jesus as who he is. 
because she knew he had the power to save. Roman Reigns does not have the power to save me. He has the power to entertain me, but he doesn't have the power to save me. I acknowledge one person. I only kneel for one person. I only pray to one person. I only give my offerings to one person. My maker, my savior, and his spirit that lives inside of me. I acknowledge one for the power to save, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's what this sinner, there's no other religion, you know that, right? There's no other religion out there. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Hinduism, not Sinkteria, not any of these other crazy things that I, I hate to say, not Catholicism, not uh, uh, Lutheranism, not uh, not assemblies of Godisms, not uh, baptis, uh, baptisms. I'm coming up with all kinds of crazy words today. There's only one way to Jesus and to to God, and it's not because of religion. It's because of the relationship to acknowledge that there's only one way to save. You can clap to that as loud as you want. That's the whole purpose of this cross. That was the whole purpose because we don't serve a God that is dead. We serve a God that is risen and is alive. And you know what? A repentant heart has the humility to ask for grace. A repentant heart, number five, is the ability to ask for grace. He said, Jesus, remember me when you get into your kingdom. When you come into your kingdom, remember me. I am no better of Jesus. But I'm going to ask you for grace. Please remember me. And grace isn't something new to, to the Bible. Grace is not something new to the cross. When, when Adam and Eve sinned, what did Jesus do? He didn't say, I'm going to kill you and you're out of my life forever. He said, no, here's some clothes. Here's a little fig leaf. Here's a little bikini for you, Eve. And he clothes them. He gives them grace and says, because you did that, now you have to suffer some things. He didn't kill them. He didn't curse them. He, didn't, he kicked them out. But he said, you're not out for good. You still can come back. It's just going to be different. See, our, our repentant heart, they ha we have the humility to ask for grace. Isn't that beautiful? I don't have to do anything to earn my salvation. He did it. He did it. I don't have to. Where's my amen guy? My little amen man. Amen. It means all the good works that I do throughout the week and the months, that doesn't account for my salvation? No. We were made to do good works. Why? Because our good works, we get to glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. When I do bad works, who does that glorify? The Satan, the little snake in the grass. See, our good works are meant to glorify God and to show his love and his grace and his mercy. And there is a reward for it. And this is what I want, I'm going to end it. The reward for us asking for the grace and accepting the coming down off our thrones and coming down and asking for humility, we have a reward, it says. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today, today, I assure you, Bobby Jean, today, Myrna, I assure you, today, Sharon, I assure you, today, Rico, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. 
not because of us, but because of him. Not because of anything we've ever done in our lives. The word says, each and every one of us is evil. And I have a choice to either be a rebellious heart my whole life, or a repentant heart, and to follow and do love. How do I do that? I have a relationship. I accept the cross. I accept the empty tomb into my life. I accept Jesus into my heart, my mind, my soul, my spirit. Not that I am perfect, and will I ever be on this side of heaven, but in my maker's eyes, I am perfect, it says. Will you have shame? Will you have guilt? You know why? Yeah, because you know you did something wrong. But that's the beauty of this. We don't have to feel that way. We don't have to let anxiety overtake us. We don't have to let depression overtake us. We don't have to let our situations rule the way we live. Why? Because our God, our Savior, our Messiah, He lives. Amen? But it starts with that relationship. So bow your heads. Close your eyes. Because it does. There's a reward waiting for you in heaven. And we're going to talk about next week, like I said, our, our, uh, our death is not fate or, uh, final. Our death is not final next week. Because there's more to this story. But it starts with the cross. It starts with the, the option. Rebellious heart, repentant heart. You don't deserve the gift of salvation, but we given is given to us anyways. If you've never accepted that, if you're watching today, if you never accepted that gift in the empty tomb, which we will talk more about next week, today is your salvation day. day. Today is your day to be in paradise with him. If that's you today, and you need to ask Jesus to all these things, I, a repentant heart fears God. A repentant heart acknowledges sins. He acknowledges Jesus' innocence. He acknowledges the power of, the, of Jesus. And if you're willing to ask and submit and become humble and ask for the grace that comes in the cross today, and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to look at me. I want you to acknowledge him in some way. Amen. Amen. See these seats that are empty today? Those seats should not be empty next week. That's our job. To bring people into his house next week. We usually bring the gospel to them, right? On the street. But next Sunday is the biggest Sunday of the year for most churches. Because people need to hear about the empty tomb. People need to hear about the empty tomb and the hope we have. Because our death is not final. If you decided today to accept grace into your life, to accept Jesus, I want us to all pray together this prayer. Hey, can you get somebody tell them to be a little quieter over there? They're playing a really fun game, but I don't, I'm, I'm losing my voice. We're going to all stand up and we're all going to pray together today. If you're capable of standing, stand up. That's my guys over here too. Nobody excluded out. And everybody just pray with me. And if this is the first time you are praying this prayer, afterwards we have a Bible for you to welcome you to the table, to welcome you into the family of God. Because you accepted the empty tomb into your life. So Father God, I am a sinner. I acknowledge I am a sinner. Lord, I repent of my sins. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for the empty tomb. Lord, I ask by the grace of your will 
to come into my heart, to forgive me, to let me be born again. And I thank you for your son, Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen. I love you all. You guys can have a seat. I love you all. Thank you for being here. We have a saying at Impact Church. What does that say? Be a, as we leave here this week, let us go be a blessing. Amen? Amen.